Hi guys, it's Rob from Royal Balls. A little bit of a different setting today. Uh, we're sitting in my office and we're going to review this paper. Probably one of the most important but probably one of the most misquoted and misinterpreted papers that I have seen on social media especially when it comes to ball pythons. Now I'm not going to read this paper verbatim to you. I'm going to summarize it. There is an abstract but the devil is always in the detail so I would ask you guys to get online and download a copy of this paper yourself and read it for yourself if you're at all interested. So the field study was carried out in southeastern Nigeria and I'm going to throw up some slides here just to show you some of my own research and some of the ecosystems, climate, etc. for this region and the range that ball pythons are naturally found in. So the field study was carried out mainly in the wet season and that is a little bit of a misnomer because out here in the tropics uh, the wet season is still usually sunny all morning into the afternoon but then it rains every afternoon. Um, the dry season is, is not particularly dry either, it just rains a little bit less than the wet season. But it is a little bit cooler and that's probably the main reason why this study was done. Uh, so the study was conducted from early June to late September, a period of four months. So right there that tells you that this database is actually for a very limited time period. It's for a certain period of the year. It's certainly not a study done over the full year or even years. Um, there's a little bit of extra data in here from September and October and from April and May and some location variation. But Southeast Nigeria is where this study was conducted and ball pythons of course range well outside southeastern Nigeria so the study is also limited in geographic extent. The sort of terrain that was covered is permanently flooded swamp, rainforest and areas that have been cleared for cultivation for cassava and for oil palms and also contains some dryland rainforest patches Ball python's natural terrain actually extends into savannah grasslands. So the feature of this particular area is that it is tropical rainforest and there's lots of trees. So if ball pythons are going to climb, they're going to climb here. But just be aware that a ball python's natural range extends beyond that into savannah grasslands where there are a lot fewer trees. The climate is typical for a tropical sub-Saharan country and has well marked dry and wet seasons. The dry season extends from November to April when this study was not conducted whereas the wet season goes from May to October. So it's the wet season when this study was conducted. Why is that particularly important? Well it's the wet season that is the period of maximum productivity in the tropics. It's when everything gives birth it's when new plants grow, it's when flowers grow, it's a time of seasonal abundance and it's also nesting season. This is when birds lay their eggs and raise their babies. Python regis is a species widespread and lo locally abundant in southeastern Nigeria. So it is found throughout the area. We found it especially in bushy and dryland rainforest patches, but interestingly, occasionally also in permanently flooded swamp forests, along creeks and riverbanks, and even into suburban areas. So we're already painting a picture here of a remarkably adaptable snake that can actually live in a variety of sub-habitats within this tropical region, including suburban areas. The paper itself uh, was originally formulated and the research was undertaken to look at sexual size dimorphism in ball pythons which means that they were looking at the difference in the size of males and females and they did in fact find that there is some size dimorphism but the interesting throw off from that research was that they also found a dietary difference between 
the different sizes of ball pythons in the study, which they correlate to sexual dimorphism, which means they found a different diet in males and in females. And I'm going to question that later on in the paper. From the data that they've provided, I would not have made that conclusion. Field trips were conducted both on sunny and on rainy days. Each day the field research team um, went out into the field from approximately 8am to 6pm. And that's daylight. That's when ball pythons are not typically active, but it also makes them easier to catch. So the snakes were actually located or trapped. Pitfall traps were used, drift fences were used, and flat objects were used that were placed under, on the ground and were checked under each day. That's a very important point in the paper. Uh, most of these ball pythons were captured on the ground. The study included 29 males and 33 females, so an approximate equality in terms of sexes, but not a huge sample size. Um, I would have liked to have seen more, a larger sample size for a conclusion as important as this one, but for the purposes of our exercise here, that's not too significant. Now, another important point here is that some specimens were recaptured several times, and in fact, 38 males and 49 females were sampled, but 25% of those were repeat offenders. So snakes that are behaving in this way were recaptured several times so the data set actually includes about 25 percent of repeat offenders and that's also important because snakes that have learned to exploit a particular food source are repeat offenders so the captured specimens uh, were examined and sexed by analyzing the morphology of the tail and i'm not sure exactly what that means did they just look at a visual examination of the tail did they actually pop or probe these snakes? Um, how did they actually perform that sexing? Because as we know, it's very difficult from just visual examination to actually sex a snake. But for the purposes of this exercise, it probably doesn't matter. And certainly 29 males and 33 females would suggest that the population that they sampled, it's about 50-50. So I'm not too concerned that they missexed these, and as scientists I have to assume that they did do it correctly. There's a lot of data here about the size of the snakes that were sampled. Uh, so we have mean size data, we have standard deviation data. A lot of it actually concerns the sexual dimorphism rather than the diet. Um, but the important thing for us is that overall males were shorter than females. The average length of the males sampled was 82 centimetres, but the females were significantly larger. Uh, the mean size was 97.7 centimetres. So the paper explains various statistical tests that were done in order to uh, quantify the significance of that size deviation. But generally, males shorter than females. Note there is no age data presented and there is no weight data given but I'm going to add that for you at least for our captive bred snakes I think you can assume that wild caught snakes will be slightly lighter for the length but in order to determine that there is sexual dimorphism I think it would be reasonable to expect to compare snakes of comparable ages so for instance a male that's five years old could be bigger than a female that's two years old and without knowing the age of the snakes which of course in this sample set they couldn't possibly do it's actually very difficult to draw any conclusions about sexual dimorphism what we need to do is to compare snakes of comparable ages is a two-year-old female bigger than a two-year-old male that data is not provided and neither is weight but I'm sure they did have that data and for the purposes of determining the lifestyle of these snakes I don't think it's particularly important to distinguish between males and females 
one of the main conclusions of the paper here is that it, it's males that have a different lifestyle to the females and I'm going to challenge that. Um, I don't see that the data supports that conclusion. I do see dimorphism but I don't see sexual dimorphism. There is a clear break point in lifestyle for these snakes at a certain length which also I'm assuming equates to a certain weight and probably a certain age but I don't see a distinction between males and females at least not from the data provided from this paper so the conclusions that I'm going to draw apply across the board males and females okay guys what I want to do here is let's keep it real let's get some sort of idea about what size of snake we're talking about in this study this tape measure here is measuring 70 centimeters if I show you that there that is 70 centimeters which is an important datum for this study so let's pick out a snake which is 70 centimeters in length that is quite a big snake So let's pick out this guy here, too big, too big, I'm looking for something smaller than that, what have I got? So we're going down to the hatchling rack here to try and find a snake of that size. Okay guys, that will do nicely. 70 centimetres. This is actually a female, not a male. And she is a 2021 snake, so less than a year old. So within this size group here, we're looking at A fairly small sized ball python. If this was a male it would already be mature. We're looking at snakes that are anywhere up to a year old of this size. Let's get a weight on this size range and this is for a captive snake. You would probably assume that a wild snake of this length is going to be a little bit thinner but let's just get a weight on what our 70 centimeter sized snake is going to weigh. Let's just stick her on the scales to give you some idea and this snake is about 700 grams so roughly seven months old I guess about 100 grams per month in captivity so we're looking at a snake that is well under a kilo in weight and probably less than a year old certainly our captive snakes would be less than a year old at this size so that's the 70 centimeter age group we're looking at yearlings. The next important size group is the 100 centimetre or 1 metre snake and that is almost the full length of this table. That is definitely not a, a yearling snake or even a sub-adult. Uh, by the time snakes are getting this big they are going to be sexually mature so we're not necessarily looking at small snakes here let me pull out a couple of those banana snakes again because i suspect that these are the sort of size that we're going to be looking at for a snake this banana cinnamon enchi is about 100 centimeters long this is a male uh, so he's quite skinny in comparison to what a female would be at this size but that is the sort of size that we're looking at. This would be definitely a mature breed, a male snake. Um, this is sexually mature for a male. So let's get a weight on this guy at 100 centimeters. Okay, if I can get him on the scales and get him to keep still, see if we can do that. Yes, this snake is around about a kilo. Okay, so we're definitely looking at a mature sized male snake, certainly a breeder snake, um, more than a year old, probably between one and two years old and for females 
at a thousand grams probably still not quite breeder age so we're definitely not looking at mature snakes here they're still sub-adult but they're getting up there in terms of size males would be capable of breeding at that size females probably not so that's our 100 centimeter snake and about a kilo and our 70 centimeter snake at about 700 grams so there's a direct correlation there 10 centimeters equals 100 grams so that is the sort of size of snake that we're looking at in that upper age group that's the cutoff for a hundred centimeter snake and above so we're looking at sub adults a mature female at two years old and 1500 grams I can't get her to straighten out you'll see that she has increased in girth significantly and is probably around about Certainly over a hundred centimeters, well over a hundred centimeters. Let's see if I can get her to stretch out so we can get some idea. Let's see if she's going to do it for us. Here we go. See if I can guide her. Yeah, so there's a female uh, over the hundred centimeters, but not much over, and she weighs about 1500 grams and is about two years old. So we're definitely looking at still young sized snakes. Let's have a look at a mature female to compare that with. This girl is certainly well over 100 centimetres. She, I haven't weighed her, but she's a breeder age female. Not a massive snake by ball python standards. They certainly get much bigger than this. But this mature female breeder snake is definitely outside of that 100 centimetre size range. She is well over that size range. In fact, she's probably a good 30 centimetres over that. And this girl is also well over two kilos and let's not forget that a good sized breeder male is also well in excess of that hundred centimeter size range so males do get well over a hundred centimeters okay some of the paper here goes into how they actually identified the stomach contents of the snakes and there's a difference between examining stomach contents and examining the poo and they actually present an argument that looking at stomach contents and looking at poo is the same and again I'm going to challenge that uh, my experience on feeding snakes with chickens is that feathers always come out in the poo it's easy to distinguish when snakes have been eating birds even from the poo when they're eating rodents it's not so easy the poo becomes fairly homogeneous and it's very difficult to identify actually what the snake has been eating but again for the purposes of this exercise all we're concerned with is really identifying whether they've been eating birds or whether they've been eating rats so again, for the purposes of this exercise in detail, I would challenge that examining stomach contents and examining faeces is the same. Uh, but for the purpose of this exercise, all we need to be certain of is whether the animals concerned have been eating birds or eating rodents. And I think that that's uh, perfectly obvious from the study and the data that's available. Even looking at snake poo, we can tell whether these guys have been eating birds or eating mammals, rodents. So here is the table and I'm not going to go through all the individual species. There is a wide variety of birds and a wide variety of rodents. The rodents include rats, voles, mice, squirrels which are arboreal and also bats which you would typically find roosting. In this case the argument is in a tree. The bird species that were found in the stomach contents you can see um, are actually quite a wide variety of birds a lot of these are actually weaver birds uh, various finches um, quite small active and very fast birds and when I look down this list my first question is how on earth could any ball python ever possibly hope to catch one of these birds whether it's on the ground or in a tree how are they doing it? They're not designed for catching birds. They're not fast enough. Well, there's a dead giveaway here on the list. If we go down the list, 
you will see that the species found in the stomach contents of ball pythons includes grey parrots. A grey parrot is a very large bird and there is no way that even an adult ball python would be eating a grey parrot. So my assumption here is that they're not actually eating the fully grown birds, they're eating hatchlings. They would have to be eating the hatchlings of grey parrots because a fully grown grey parrot is too large for a ball python to eat. So I'm assuming based upon the season that the study was conducted in and the list of prey species that a ball python couldn't possibly hope to catch or is too large to eat that these animals are nest robbers. Why is that important? Nest robbers must climb trees. Yes, of course they must climb trees. But why is it important in terms of lifestyle? Number one, hatchling season is seasonal by definition. So these snakes are taking advantage of an opportunity that is seasonally available, which means that it's not available year round and they're not doing this activity year round. We can't see that in the data set because the study was conducted in hatchling season. It also means that these animals are not living in trees, they're simply climbing trees to rob nests and then returning to the ground. And that is obvious from the data set provided by the scientific study in that the vast majority of these snakes were captured not in trees but on the ground. Now, in fact, some of these snakes were actually found in trees. And here again, there is a very significant difference in size between the snakes that were found in trees and the ones that were found on the ground. In fact, 14 of 29 male specimens, which have an average size of 80 centimeters, that's about half of the population were actually caught in the act climbing trees. Only two out of 33 females, which averaged 97 centimetres in length, were actually caught in the act and found in a tree. That is extremely significant. It would appear that there is a very significant difference in climbing activity with size, not necessarily with sex. Now in this context the authors of the paper uh, go to great pains to point out that it is however noteworthy that arboreality and bird eating are not always correlated events in snakes. All snakes can climb. There are many species of terrestrial snakes that do take advantage of the seasonal food source available from hatchling birds and they climb trees to get them. They are robbing nests. So here we see a cobra doing it and I don't think by any stretch of the imagination anybody would ever call a cobra an arboreal or semi-arboreal snake but here we have a cobra taking advantage of a seasonal opportunity, climbing a tree and robbing a nest. All snakes can climb. With regard to the prey eaten by royal pythons it may be noted that all the mammalian species are widespread and relatively abundant in the forest ecosystems of the studied region. Thus it is likely that opportunism represents an intrinsic trait of the predatory behaviour of these snakes. So what that means is that these snakes will take advantage of any opportunity they can and eat a wide variety of prey depending upon its availability. The important part of this paper for us is that males preyed more frequently upon birds, 70% of the total prey items found in either stomach contents or in poo, and only 30% of total prey items were mammals. Now that's in the group of males, and as I've said, this is already a biased data set. We've already concluded that males are smaller than females, and it's the small size snakes that are eating birds, whereas females, which are the larger group, averaging 97 centimetres in length, 
preyed more frequently upon mammals, 66.7% of the total number of prey items, whereas birds made up only 33% of the total number of prey items. The authors of the paper are actually concluding that there is a difference between males and females. Um, the data does not support that. The data only says that smaller snakes eat birds and larger snakes don't. And I think it's irrelevant whether they're males or females. I think both sexes below a certain size eat birds. And once they reach a certain size, that behavior stops. And the authors actually point that out. There is an apparent ontogenic change, which means a change with age or size, in diet of both sexes. So they are actually saying that my conclusion is correct. This is both sexes, not limited to males, not limited to females, both sexes. Specimens shorter than 70 centimeters preyed almost exclusively upon small sized birds, nestlings and immature, so there we go they are actually pointing out these are nestlings and immature birds, not the full grown ones. So there we have it. The authors are actually pointing out nest robbing rather than arboreality, which means that the snakes live in the trees. They don't. Whereas the longer specimens, 100 centimeters total length, whether they were male or female, preyed almost entirely upon small mammals. So there we go only the smaller snakes are eating birds and I would add which the authors do not state but is apparent from the data set I would add that only the smaller snakes are eating birds on a seasonal basis I would imagine that if we came back in the dry season when the birds are not nesting that this data set would be completely different I would also point out that the natural range of bull pythons includes savanna grasslands where there are far fewer trees so if the geographical range of this study had been increased i think you would find a different result so i'm painting a picture of bull pythons when they're small and agile are nest robbers and they will take advantage of any opportunity they can to climb trees and steal hatchlings from the nest but it's also readily apparent that larger specimens, both male and female, stop doing this. No matter how attractive the opportunity might be of eating birds in trees, snakes larger than about 70 centimeters simply can't do it anymore. Let's have a look at why that might be. Let's have a look at the preferred locomotion methods of various types of snake. All snakes can do all of these movements, but certainly um, the preferred method of propulsion varies from snake to snake. I think typically we picture snakes as having a serpentine motion, which is the snake in the top of this picture, which has an S curve, and they are simply using the outside radius of their body at each curve to push backwards. And this is the serpentine movement that we typically associate with snakes and in fact ball pythons don't use this method of locomotion very much they're a very thick set heavy bodied snake and they much prefer rectilinear motion you've seen rectilinear motion on my free roaming videos and this is where the snake actually crawls in a straight line using its belly scoots it's more like a uh, caterpillar traction motion they're actually crawling on their belly scoots and you can see the rhythmic muscular contractions that go down the snake that propel the snake forward it's a slower method of propulsion but it is the preferred method of propulsion for a ball python rectilinear motion is not very good in trees Another type of motion that snakes employ is a concertina motion. This is where a snake will wrap part of its body around an object and then propel itself forwards or upwards and recoil the upper part of its body and then drag the lower part of its body up. So we can use concertina motion in order to climb trees. This is how green tree pythons, how small reticulated pythons and other longer bodied muscular snakes will climb trees and it's how they maintain their balance you can see that in the picture 
We have a snake moving along a wooden branch and it has coils on each side of the branch so it's effectively maintaining a center of gravity right on the branch and this is much more effective for climbing trees. Ball pythons can do this but when they do this method of climbing they are incapable of striking very far to catch active prey items and they're incapable of coiling that prey to subdue it whereas a green tree python would maintain a center of gravity has a very long strike range extremely long teeth for penetrating feathers and flesh and is quite capable of constricting a bird that it captures while it's still hanging on to a branch a ball python doesn't really do that which again forces us to the conclusion that smaller ball pythons which are still agile enough to climb trees are robbing nests. They are not preying on adult bird species, they are not capable of catching them. So what we're effectively saying with this study is that these little snakes here, seven months old, eight months old, less than a year old, can certainly climb trees and rob nests. By the time they get to this sort of size, very few of them can actually still climb. No matter how many hatchling birds are on offer, a snake of this size finds it very difficult to climb up a tree and get them. And by the time they get to this size, two years old, 1500 grams, there is no way that this snake can climb a tree and rob a bird's nest, no matter how tempting the opportunity might be. They simply cease to do it. Not surprising, when you look at the girth and the weight of this snake, this is a terrestrial snake, it's short, thick and powerful. It's not designed for climbing trees. So what are the implications for us when we keep ball pythons in terrariums or naturalistic setups? Um, I think the uh, terrarium experiment has shown that neither of these snakes actually uh, do any climbing. The only time that they have climbed is when they're unsettled when they first go into the terrarium uh, they tend to wander restlessly huffing and obviously stressed and they do climb and push and probe at the roof of the terrarium um, this is an attempt to escape and after a couple of days settling in they cease to do it and they do not climb anymore if you're going to provide climbing opportunities for your snake you can see in this setup here how i've provided ledges and very wide climbing structures so that the snake can use rectilinear motion rather than having to concertina to climb. They're much more relaxed when they can climb on wide structures with ledges so that they can use their preferred rectilinear motion. Both of these snakes in the terrarium have exhibited very strong diurnal cyclicity once they settle into their enclosure and this particular setup here has opportunities for the snake to go underground which is something I've not seen in many terrarium setups uh, most of us tend to focus on cluttering up the structure at the base and putting in hides and things to allow the snake to hide away during the day but this terrarium has an underground system and there's a couple of entrances with tubes that lead down into an underground tub and both snakes have shown a distinct preference for going underground. During the day, they spend most of their day coiled up either in the tubes, which is nice and tight where they feel secure, or actually underground in the tub where there is a nice tight hide in the tub and they spend all day there. At night, they move out a short distance and move to the front of the terrarium and set up an ambush position. So they're not moving very far, they're not expending a great deal of energy and they are very much orientated towards where the food comes from. They move right to the front of the terrarium and they're always ready to eat. When it gets to morning they retreat back underground and spend all day underground. Now I'm going to say that because my terrarium does not use any heating, I use ambient temperature 
the snakes to a large extent are free to move where they want to move um, there is no constraint on their behavior or their choice of activity or location within the terrarium because it's all the same temperature and it's all optimal for them they can live eat and digest all at the same temperature so they don't display a preference for moving in and out of a hot spot for instance if your terrarium opens at the top and you feed from the top you can expect your ball python to orient to where the food comes from so if you feed from the top expect your snake to climb up to the top and set up an ambush position as close as possible to where the food comes in that's a very strong behavioral change depending upon the setup of your terrarium and i think many people underestimate how the setup of their terrariums affect the behavior of their snake number one your terrarium should have a variety of opportunities for the snake to use but number two that behavior should not be determined by a need to move away from heat or move towards heat in order to regulate its body temperature um, I'm going to quote a reference here for a YouTube video from Reptiles and Research channel. This is not a channel I normally watch, but it is a good channel to pick up the latest news on what animal rights activists are doing to our hobby and some of the restrictions that they would like to place upon us. Um, but this particular video is very interesting because it shows a 23-foot bioactive setup at Marwell Zoo in southern England and there are a couple of ball pythons in here and that setup to me is spectacular it is a great example of the natural habitat of a ball python and the climbing opportunities provided to those ball pythons are very low climbing opportunities nice wide branches and it's commensurate with a ball python's ability to climb they do keep adult ball pythons in there and it would surprise me greatly if they do use any of those climbing opportunities there's no food available up there so why should they climb adult ball pythons show a distinct preference for having their bellies on the ground now this is also a good example from my perspective of how the setup of the terrarium can affect the behavior of the snakes at around about 150 in the video it's only a short video less than three minutes at around about 150 you can see an adult bull python which has been fed curled up digesting its food in the open this is completely unnatural behavior and it's being driven by the fact that the lighting and heating arrangements in this uh, 23 foot terrarium are forcing the snake to select that location because that's the optimum temperature this is not natural behavior this is being driven by the hot spot and the snake has sought out a hot spot to digest its meal completely in the open but it lends itself extremely well to the exhibit because it's a zoo and the animal is permanently on display and people can see it so as far as the zoo is concerned this is an ideal setup the snakes probably do thrive in this terrarium setup although there are no underground opportunities and i didn't see a great deal of spaces for the snakes to hide again probably because this is an exhibit and the animals are in full view all the time if they were given more opportunity to decouple themselves from the need to stay warm and the need to stay on display i think you would find that these ball pythons would by preference hide and you would never see them which is not great for an exhibit but is an example of how we can control a snake's behavior by the setup of our terrariums my terrarium here is ambient temperature so those drivers have been removed but the driver for food is extremely important in the way the snakes behave in the terrarium they orient very strongly to the direction that food comes in so if you're feeding from the top expect your snake to modify its behavior based on an intercept position which is closer to where the food comes in okay so in the process of doing research for this paper over many years i've accumulated some climate data that i want to share with you and explain to you how i keep my ball pythons here in the tropics with no heat mats and no temperature control on the room 
and we can see on the world map here where West Africa is uh, we've just had a look at that in our uh, look at sexual dimorphism in ball pythons and you can see that where I live in Southeast Asia we're at almost exactly the same latitude just a couple of degrees above the equator and the e ecosystems that are present in Southeast Asia are predominantly tropical rainforest exactly as for the snakes in southeastern Nigeria that we've just looked at. Now in terms of climate tropical rainforests are some of the most stable climates on the planet. You can see here that there is very little difference in maximum temperatures during the day throughout the year uh, varying between about 33 and 31 Celsius so perhaps a couple of degrees difference in maximum temperature during the day and at night time temperatures are around about 24 25 centigrade so a few degrees cooler but again the minimum temperature at night changes very little throughout the year these snakes are not experiencing any radical changes in temperature throughout the season. If we look at the difference between daytime maximum temperatures and nighttime minimums, we, we are seeing probably around about 8 degrees centigrade temperature drop at night. But that does not mean that the snakes living in these environments experience the same temperature drop. I frequently explain to people that out here in the tropics we never see snakes uh, basking during the day. It's far too hot. They have no need to do that. During the day they'll find somewhere cool to stay out of the heat of the sun. At night they'll find somewhere warm to stay out of the cold of the night. So most of these snakes you will find throughout their lives maintain a fairly constant temperature and they do this by picking an ideal spot in which to hole up that maintains that temperature for them and in the case of our ball pythons simply by spending a majority of their time underground insulates them from the heat of the day and insulates them from the cool of the night so if we look at the temperature that we see in Southeast Asia in Kuala Lumpur here you will see that daytime maximums are almost exactly the same nighttime minimums are almost exactly the same and the seasonal variation is almost non-existent again let me repeat that the tropical climates that ball pythons come from are some of the most stable climates on the planet these snakes are not experiencing any great variations in temperature throughout the season or between day and night simply because their habits uh, allow them to maintain a fairly constant temperature so my climate here in Southeast Asia is absolutely ideal for keeping ball pythons without any form of temperature control all I need is a nice room that's buffered from the daytime highs and the nighttime lows that maintains a fairly constant temperature throughout the year. You can see on my thermometer here in my snake room that the ambient temperature at 739 in the morning is 30 degrees centigrade and it's 71 percent relative humidity and trust me that is very humid at 30 degrees centigrade that is hot and sticky and you sweat when you're inside the snake room. So none of my enclosures in my snake room have any form of temperature control whatsoever uh, 30 degrees this morning 30 degrees tonight 30 degrees next week 30 degrees next month the temperature will vary very little now what I do see during the season is very small fluctuations in temperature based upon the season in the wet season typically we will see a very small drop in temperature down to about 29 centigrade perhaps and at the peak of the dry season when it's at its hottest outside the, room, the temperature in my snake room will climb to 31 so I am seeing on an annual basis probably only 2 degrees centigrade variation in temperature all year round 
This mimics the natural environment of ball pythons in the tropics and the stable temperatures that they will try to maintain simply by their lifestyle. You will not see tropical snakes basking because they don't need to. You will not see tropical snakes out during the day because it's far too hot. They do tend to be more active in the evenings or early in the morning or, or throughout the night in the case of nocturnal snakes. I have been very fortunate in my career to have visited some of the most unspoiled tropical rainforests in Southeast Asia and seen many, many snakes in the wild behaving as wild snakes behave. And in particular, here in Southeast Asia, the reticulated python. And rest assured that reticulated pythons are not out and about in the sun during the day. No tropical snake ever does this. So forget uh, temperature variations, forget basking, forget all of your preconceived ideas about thermal regulation. For a tropical snake, thermal regulation means maintaining a pretty constant body temperature. Thermal regulation, I think, to most people would be the sort of lifestyle that temperate snakes have to endure, where during the night it gets cold and during the day they need to warm themselves up before they get going. Thermal regulation involves the snake heating up and cooling down. Not so for a tropical snake. They maintain a fairly constant body temperature because it's actually fairly easy for them to do so. Simply by seeking out shade or shelter, they can avoid the heat of the day and they can avoid the cool of the night. Their body temperatures stay stable. That is mimicked in my tubs. And when temperatures reach around about 30 Point 0.5 or higher I start to see my snakes getting uncomfortable and they start to wrap their water bowls excessively. Most of the time they don't, most of the time they're quite comfortable at room temperature but if the temperature in the room does rise I may need to add a touch of air conditioning if I see the majority of my snakes are actually excessively bowl wrapping. That tells me that they're uncomfortable at those temperatures. That occurs before 31 Celsius. My snakes also never get cooler than about 28 centigrade throughout the year. If temperatures drop lower than that, and I have experienced on occasion some particularly cool nights here in Southeast Asia for a prolonged period where temperatures do drop down to 27 or even 26 in the snake room. When temperatures start to get that low, my snakes start to get lethargic, they start to refuse to eat food, and they can have digestive issues. Typically when temperatures drop as low as that, they have trouble digesting and we start getting runny poos or, or part digested rat within the poo. And that's not normally a problem. So my snakes stay at a stable temperature year round. I don't cool, I don't heat, I don't do anything. And yet my snakes breed just fine. I know many people employ quite complex systems of controlling temperature. If we have heat mats, you can control the temperature of the heat mats. You can control the temperature during the night and during the day. And if you have heat control in your room, you can also control ambient temperature. You can warm it up or you can cool it down and you can create a thermal gradient in your tubs. I don't do any of that and my snakes breed just fine. Your male snakes do not need to be cooled to generate sperm. Mine generate sperm year round. They're always ready to pair with females and it depends upon the receptiveness of your female as to whether the males will lock or not. My snakes do not need cooling in order to produce fertile sperm year round. My boys are always ready to go. Where I think that very small temperature variations, which naturally my seasons give me, produce uh, a response from female snakes to build follicles, it's in response to a very tiny change in temperature from, from perhaps a peak of 30 degrees centigrade down to a low in the wet season of 29. I may even add a touch of air conditioning to drop the temperature down to 28 centigrade 
just to let the females know that it is the wet season, it is time to breed and stimulate the, that follicle growth. But note that the temperature variation in my room is within three degrees centigrade of an average temperature year round. So again, my females need a very small adjustment to temperature in order to get them to start building follicles, which is when they become receptive and my males are always ready to breed with them. So given that that's the case, given that a lot of my snake keeping techniques dispel a lot of the methods that are used by breeders in more temperate climates where cooling periods are considered to be necessary, my snakes don't get any of that and they're quite happy to breed with very small temperature fluctuations throughout the year. And in fact, I don't really worry about temperature controls and adding AC is a very rare event in any case because the seasons naturally take care of that. I think my snakes are sensitive to barometric pressure changes, very sensitive to barometric pressure changes and in the wet season when the barometer drops very slightly, again barometric pressures here in the tropics tend to be extremely stable and it only needs a very small change to kick these snakes into breeding mode. So my next addition of electronic equipment in my snake room is going to be a barometer. I want to measure over the length of my season whether my snakes are responding to barometric pressure. They're certainly not responding to much in the way of a temperature change or indeed humidity which remains high throughout the year. So that's the way that I keep my snakes here. Basically I do very little to control their environment. The tropical climate that I live in provides them with everything they need and they have no problem at all breeding. So I'm wondering is it actually necessary to cool your snakes to get them to breed? They don't experience that in their natural environments. They don't experience that in the way that I keep them. Certainly not any significant temperature changes outside of the seasonal changes that the wet season brings, which is a couple of degrees at best. And so I am questioning whether our traditional methods of keeping these snakes and getting them to breed by using all sorts of complex uh, permutations of cooling heat mats, uh, day and night temperature cycles, ambient room changes, whether any of that is actually necessary. My snakes are quite happy to remain at a constant temperature all year round. They remain healthy. I have very few health issues with my snakes. I have no shedding issues at the high humidities that the tropics offers. And I just wanted to share that with you guys. Obviously in temperate climates your snakes are going to need some sort of temperature control because it's too cold otherwise and they would not be able to survive. So we are going to need the use of heat mats. Traditionally we use heat mats and we keep our hot spots at the temperature the snakes need in order to digest their food and remain healthy. For all of you guys who are contemplating getting rid of your heat mats and going to ambient temperature where you simply control the temperature of the room and therefore you do away with heat gradients within your tubs, um, go for it. It works just fine for me. My snakes remain at an optimum temperature all the time. No need for any variation day or night. As long as you keep them within the window 28 centigrade to 31 centigrade, my snakes are absolutely fine all the time. So if you are going to do that but you have reservations because of some of the stuff that you've read about cooling cycles and breeding ball pythons, I would say that for me um, I have no issues whatsoever. My snakes are just fine and they breed just fine. So that's it guys, that's a fairly long video for you guys. I just wanted to share the way that I keep my snakes out here and perhaps dispel a few myths in the way that we keep ball pythons and some of our misconceptions about thermoregulation and temperature gradients uh, because my snakes don't get any of that. 
And to encourage all you guys that are thinking about moving to ambient as opposed to heat mats, it may not be practical for everybody, and heat mats do certainly work. We can keep these snakes in a variety of different environments and a variety of different ways. But to all of you that are worried about temperature gradients when you switch to ambient because you're going to have a constant temperature in your snake room, I would encourage you to do so uh, because it works just fine for me. That's the way everybody keeps their snakes out here in the tropics. No temperature controls at all. And in fact, uh, I do know people that actually incubate their eggs at room temperature here in the tropics and the eggs hatch just fine. No need for an incubator. So that's it guys, a lot of food for thought there, a lot of potential controversy. Um, I do accept that. There are many different ways to keep these snakes and all of the methods seem to work, which is a testament to the resilience of these creatures. Jump down in the comments below and have at it in terms of a discussion. I'm quite happy to answer questions or even let you know where I don't know what the answers are and have some degree of uncertainty. I will certainly attempt to stimulate discussion and thought. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to share, like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.